What is the Bible really telling us? We'll talk about it on this episode of the Mind Dog TV podcast. Is everybody ready for the Mind Dog to make it to the show? Welcome, my friends, to yet another episode of the Mind Dog TV Podcast. I'm Matt Napo. Thanks for coming. It's great to have you here, as always. It's a Friday, and for a lot of people who are saying, hey, we made it through another week, but not me. <laughs> my week ends on Saturday and begins on Sunday. I don't really have a day off ever, but I'm not complaining. I'm just saying my week does not end on Friday. We have a good show today. We have uh, another edition of Meet the Author, and my guest today is an author who writes about faith. He writes about philosophy, uh, spiritual health, mental health, all those good things. And it should be a very interesting conversation. I hope you'll stick with us. Before I bring him in, I have to talk a little bit about my sponsors. Today's show is sponsored by audiobooksnow.com. Audiobooks Now. Why audiobooks now? Well, you know all about the convenience of audiobooks. Everybody does. But you can get them anywhere. You can literally get audiobooks in so many places. I can't keep count of them. There's just lots of them out there. So why audiobooks now? Well, audiobooksnow.com, uh, price point, price point, price point. Uh, it, their club pricing plan is the best deal on audiobooks you'll find. It offers uh, savings and flexibility not found anywhere else with their save on everything discounts, rollovers, exclusive offers, loyalty program, incredible selection, and cancel anytime policy. It simply can't be beat. Plus, get a free premium audiobook on select titles. Start your 30 day free trial now. Go to audiobooksnow.com. Use the link in the description, and you're uh, absolutely free to try it for 30 days, and you can cancel whenever you want. Uh, and I do appreciate you patronizing them. And, again, the links will be in the sponsor. Also, today's show is uh, sponsored by FunWise Capital. FunWise Capital is a business lender matching platform that gets you the best lines of credit guaranteed. Apply online in 60 seconds or less, and there's no effect to your credit to see how much you can get. Use the funding for anything you need to start or grow your business. That's right. I did say start or grow your business. Uh, listen, if you want to start a business, though, you really have to have a solid business plan, marketing plan, really documented well. If you get all that and visit with a CPA and a marketing director or, or somebody of that ilk to help you get your business plan documented. If you get all that, they can help you get funding, get the best funding you can qualify for. The strategic lender matching platform searches through hundreds of lenders to find the very best possible option for your unique situation. They have hundreds of five-star reviews on Google, Trustpilot, and Facebook, and an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. They provide unsecured lines of credit at 0% interest, interest for 9 to 15 months, unsecured term loans, loans based on income, short-term gap funding, and bridge loans, all that kind of stuff. They work with real estate startups, like I mentioned. If you have a startup and a good business plan, uh, franchises, restaurants, any kind of business, any kind of product, get started with them. Just go to apply.funwise.com slash mind dog. Apply.funwise.com slash mind dog. And again, the links will be in the description. As always, I certainly do appreciate you patronizing our sponsors. Now on to the big program. Linwood uh, Jackson Jr. is an author uh, writing on mental health and spiritual health and on its life-altering benefit. He is someone who believes in the power of the Bible's words when sincerely exercised and studied. Through his books, speeches, and discourses, he encourages people to think and feel for themselves. They uh, se That self-love may bloom into self-possession through the knowledge acquired from experience. This, he says, betters the personal and devotional life, not only for the person, but also for them, those around him. Ladies and gentlemen, please open your ears, open your minds, and help me welcome in Linwood Jackson, Jr. Linwood, welcome. Thank you. Uh, it's great to have you here. Now, uh, I'm going to start with a big, big question for you, uh, because all that stuff is nice, fancy prose that I just read. But um, what is your purpose? Purpose is to enlighten curious minds, uh, willing minds, and I would say investigative minds on the difference between religion and personal philosophy. And oh. how that and how that difference can inspire you to reach your highest potential as a human being. Wow, that, yeah. that well, that's a great purpose. Now, uh, but 
I, I'm, the, I'm the first one that needs enlightenment. Help, help me, get me started with the baby steps on the difference between the philosophy and religion. Sure. The, the way that I, I break it down is, is the way that the Bible teaches it. The Bible uses um, the illustration of an individual who today we, we know is called Jesus Christ. Just, you know, just keeping it simple, just sticking to that. The way that the first apostles taught this was that the, the man himself should not have been looked at as a man as he's nailed to a cross and crucified. It shouldn't be looked at as a human being nailed and crucified. The illustration wasn't supposed to be literal. It was figurative. It was analogical. The body in and of itself represents a religious philosophy, which, wow. Paul, which Paul, Peter, and John actually talk about in their, in their scriptures. They, they do not associate the man as a man. They associate the man's body as a religious philosophy. This religious philosophy is the number one philosophy in the Bible and the number one philosophy of religion. And religion in and of itself stems from this philosophy, which is that you're supposed to take your, your personal and devotional beauty, your personal and devotional intelligence from doing specific rites, baptisms, uh, traditions, commandments, and theological theories so that you can please a quote-unquote divine eye called God. And wow. the, crucif the, crucifixion of, the crucifixion of this body, because it represents that philosophy, it means the annihilation of that philosophy. The, the, oh man! The, the second <laughs> and better philosophy that is within the Bible is a philosophy that's without that first philosophy, which means that the religion isn't so much community-based knowledge. It's now become internal, and it's now become personal. And the separation from religion then takes place through this illustration, because you're no longer dependent on a central figure as is um, common in, in religion. Or for example, in the Buddhist religion, the, the word bud, B-U-D-H, means awake. So every, everyone we would consider in, if, if we're considering ourselves awake, there, there is the Buddha. So in a sense, the God has become self in that religion. I... What, the, what, the, what the philosophy of the Bible is saying is that there's no such thing as pleasing a God that you believe is, you know, beyond you by, by rights, whatever, whatever. And there's no such thing as pleasing the God that you think is within you by rights, whatever, whatever. This is all false. The true aspect is that the experience has to be living. The knowledge has to be personal and it has to be able to be recycled in a way that you can grow as a human being. So you cut that out, that's annihilated. Now you can get down to the fact where you can renew your mind on what you thought was true uh, devotionally. And by doing so, you can create the, the, the philosophy that you are to live by according to the experience, instead of having it dictated to you or traditionally taught and believed. And that's the main difference between religion and personal devotional philosophy which is what I write about. Wow. Mind blown. Uh, okay. Uh, and you, you, I'm sure you noticed some of my reaction there, and I, and I don't yeah. mean to be rude by it, but literally kind of uh, knock for a loop there with some of the stuff you say. Uh, some of the stuff that you say sounds to me like it would draw controversy from organized religion. Yes or no? Yes. And <laughs> and in fact, you know, I'm, I'm in that, I'm in that field. I'm, I'm that this, I'm, I'm writing, not necessarily for the lay. I'm writing to get the minds of um, supposedly brilliant ministers um, listening to what they're, they're teaching has absolutely nothing to do or is absolutely obsolete with what the fact is. And well, what you're saying makes a lot of sense to me, uh, but I've never heard it quite expressed like that, I don't think, ever in my life. So it, it, you, it was a brief statement, but it's got me kind of, almost speechless and i know i'm rambling here so it doesn't sound like i'm speechless but uh it's a lot to think about and unravel uh let's break it down a little bit if we can because um my my always, when when the subject of christianity comes up i always have described myself as a very poor christian a a man of weak faith who wants to be a christian once and you, you brought up please god or be not not a disappointment in the eyes of god but i at every at the end of every single day i feel like i've failed in that respect uh, but i when it comes down to discussing christianity i say isn't there enough to love 
in the human being that Jesus Christ re- represented in that um even even if you don't believe that he's the son of God or whatever, however you want to claim it, that it was somebody who who willingly died for for uh, for sacrifice for others for the for the world. Isn't there enough to love and respect the, about the human being, wh- even if there is no divinity? So, but what you said just kind of throws that a little bit on its side. Like, wait a minute. Uh, so, so, where am I wrong in in that? <laughs> help me, man. Help me, brother. <laughs> <laughs> it's um in in a sense the Christian religion flipped the the story that's in the Bible on its head, right? And to for example to look for a literal historical figure called Jesus Christ you'll never find that there there is no such literal historical figure called Jesus Christ. With that being said, there was a literal historical figure denoted with that same name, and this figure was not of any sort of special ancestry beyond this earth. As we're we're told in the book of Deuteronomy where this person comes from. This person is a human being, full on, full on. The only difference is is that his mind was different. So this was a, a rabbi, a specific rabbi that was not walking around calling himself Jesus Christ, was not walking around saying, worship me, or I am the, the way, the truth, and the life. This was a a rabbi that went against the Jewish religion, which in the Bible, the term the term God doesn't necessarily mean in the Greek sense theos. Hebrew religion breaks down God as being strength or doctrine. And this individual rabbi went against the the doctrine of the Jews, which taught righteousness or purity by fulfilling a criteria that was traditionally handwritten by theologians. And he said that this was not the correct doctrine to please who we should be pleasing. And for that, he was killed and, and, and was crucified. So and wow. the, the, the real story is not as you know, deviant as the Christian religion would make it because the Christian religion is, is feeding off of the Roman religion. And the, the same sort of um, things that were in the Roman religion they were implanted into the Jewish ministers that were converting to a new breed of religion for the sake of owning Rome. So it was politically driven religion that influenced the cultivation of a character called Jesus, which in that age before was not called Jesus, he was called Apollo. Wow. So there's, there's, there's a separation between the Christian religion and religion in and of itself and the Bible's philosophy and the development of the personal philosophy that's within the Bible. So it's the two figures, the historical um, created figure and the historical real rabbi figure that, that will draw conflict when I do um, say anything. This uh, I I can see that this discussion is going to generate a lot of email, uh, and I welcome it. But I am not going to have the answers to this, folks. I would say, from what I've heard so far, everything uh, you say kind of resonates with me, and and sounds like it's probably true. I know I I have believed my whole life that the uh, Roman Catholic Church was not about anything but power for, for the sure. people running it and, and political power and and financial power and, and all that stuff and was using this um religion and and to kind of foster their further their own needs i have n- no doubt of that that rings absolutely true but i know i'm certain that a lot of uh people are now wondering so if all that is true and I know this is like how is it how is it possible for a human to know this? But what is what is the nature of God? That depends on what God you're you're looking for. The Bible breaks down. I stick to what is in the Bible, so I'm not going off of a Greek based definition of what God is, um, which would be theos, what we know as theology. So theos in the Greek means God, which can either reference human beings or it can reference some kind of thing beyond human beings. And in a sense, ology is simply another Greek word meaning branch or science of. So theology, in a sense, is the the branch or science of God. And and God, in a sense, is in that aspect like Zeus or 
like Hercules. But hmm. in the in the Bible, that's not how God is defined. Right. In the Bible, the Bible defines the word God in and of itself by doctrine. Uh, you know, in John one one, in the beginning was the word. The word was God, and it just goes on. Speech is God. Words are God to the Bible in the in the in in the language. If we're going to translate it from the English into the Hebrew, or English into the Greek. Wisdom is God in the Bible, and there's two wisdoms. The first wisdom is a religious philosophy that's based off of rites, traditions, and commandments and deeds. The second God or the second wisdom or philosophy is internalizing words, learning the fact of those words, and cultivating them to then become that wisdom that you're, you're cultivating to act out not by a creed, but by conscience. So wow. that's in to the in the Bible, strictly to the Bible, that's what the nature of God is. Everything else that we know about God from religion, it comes from Babylonian and Egyptian times. So I think one of the things that that turns people away from any kind of faith in or any kind of spirituality is the, the idea that God created man in his image. And so they think mm -hmm. of god as a grandfather uh, with a white beard up in the clouds and and that kind of image and i think when people start to think of that they start to think that's a, a childhood fairy tale and so it's all a bunch of junk and it's all a bunch of silliness and anybody who believes in it is stupid uh so what would you say to the people who who uh have that issue i would say that if you're going to look at it from a surface level Yes, you should not uh, pay any attention to that. But <laughs> the the Bible is written in a way where language and context matters. And when you're hearing about God's image, the next question is, what is God's image? And the, right. portray the portrayal of what God's image is, it's given to us from that very first verse in Genesis up until that point. And from the first verse up until that point, there's no mention of any kind of human form or figure. So to link the image of God as a sort of human form or figure, or to say that human beings are created in the image of God, is a false context. The image of God is not a literal image. If you go looking again at the original language, image doesn't mean mirror in, in the natural sense. Image, in a sense, means... It does mean mirror and it does mean copy, but since we're not getting a, a literal, factual, physical frame, it then changes to what is that mirror? And if you go back and to look at the sequence of events, how it says, God said, and it was. God said, and it was. God said, and it was. And then you get to the point where you say, well, let us, plural, let us make man in our own image. And then you have an actor, and then you have a creator. There's two figures there, an actor and a creator. God said, and then the actor made it happen. There's two, two figures there. So that image breaks down into not something physical, but something philosophical. The image isn't physical. So the, wow. image, the image is philosophical. To be created in the image of God is to, is to have a likeness to what we're seeing about how creation occurred. And creation occurred through a speech and a dictated speech and a speech through routine. So to be created in the image of God is to be created in a form where you believe that in order to have any sort of obedience or any sort of love or any sort of pride or any sort of patience or any sort of devotion, that you have to then say something and for that other hearing individual to believe it. So in a sense, the image of God is a concept. It's a concept where if I say this, you have to do it in order to be considered a creation. Yeah. And, that, and that concept is religion. The, holy, image, holy. the image of God, in, that's just the first book of Genesis because there's two images that, that are there. Right. The first the first image is 
the philosophy or the concept of religion, but in the second chapter, we're told of, of, of a living soul happening. This living soul never took place in the first, in the first book of Genesis. That, mm. that, that living soul being breathed into, it's a second concept of what the image of God is. The image isn't literal, the image is philosophical. Gotcha. So, but when you say now you're talking, by the way, uh, again, I, I hate to sound like a broken record, but this is very mind blowing stuff. And I would think you're probably used to people reacting like with a, what, what is he saying? <laughs> uh, um, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, it's totally is. I mean, it's, it's different from any perspective I've ever heard before but uh where was I going with this oh you're talking about li a literal word and context of the, the words in the bible now do you yeah. read Hebrew or are you re reading the King James uh English version and is there necessary anything lost in translation <laughs> so, so the first question yes I I, tra I I read the King James version but I retranslate it into the Hebrew I retranslate the sentences the words into the Hebrew, and then I read the sentences as Hebrew, and then I retranslate it back into English. Wow. Yeah. Just so, yeah, just so that I can get the essence. So, but do you think, so do you think that then the, the King James, you, you're relying on that, you must believe that it was translated uh, very uh, faithfully and, and literally, no? No, I, I believe it was very, it was translated very poorly, and it is translated very oh. poorly. There, oh. there are, and that's why, and that's why it's the best Bible to read, because <laughs> it's it sounds weird, but it's the best Bible to read because when there's more errors, that means that there's more research for you to do. Oh, very so, cool. <laughs> so, so for me, when I, I I know that there's there's more errors than there are complete sentences in the King James version, and any kind of Bible you, you get after that, the error isn't necessarily based on the language of translation. The error is based on Christian perception. So you're, you're basically reading Christian perception in the Bibles that are printed every year, as opposed to reading the, the King James Version, which errors are there for you to, to research. And, gotcha. that's what I, and that's what I do. There's, there's so many functional errors in the Bible that I take those errors and I, I understand that that's not the word that was intended to use. So I go back into the Hebrew or I go back into the Greek. I look for the right frame or the right context of that word. And then I put it into the sentence, retranslate the sentence, get it back into English and get the essence of it. This, this is how I can, I can say image isn't necessarily physical when it comes to what's, what creation is. Uh, it would strike me that I, I don't want to sound condescending to anybody, but it would strike me that these are difficult concepts for uh, of some people to to grasp because it is a, a heavy kind of thing. So how how do you break it down for simple people who might not, you know, let's just take somebody who doesn't read that often or is poorly educated to understand the kind of things that you're talking about because it is. It is very radical and very different from from any other uh, skew on on Christ on on the nature of the Bible itself on the uh, planet. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so how would you break it down for people who are not necessarily all that educated, all that well read? Uh, mm -hmm. Simplify it for for them. How how do you go about that? Well, the good thing is uh, the good thing about religion is that. It's simple to the point where you really don't need to think. It's simple enough for us to believe it if we really have issues and we don't really want to handle them our own self. <laughs> that's, that's, that, that's what makes it believable. And knowing that is in somebody, when I do teach anything in the Bible or when I do do anything that is very intricate and detailed, I like to get the individual to think about the concepts that they already have so that when they're hearing what I'm saying, the concepts that they have are going to just click like Legos. So it's, you already know that there is this person called Jesus Christ. You already have a, a backdrop of, of some sort of special whatever. And 99% of the people, including pastors, including pastors that hear these things do not believe them. 
and they graduate from seminary also preaching what they actually do not believe and they're still searching for what they're believing. So when I do give these things and I am making sense of the language and the, the context of that language, there is already a, an, an image that we all have of what religion is. So to hear it in a correct context, it's just gonna click like Legos. And at that point, I don't have to do any sort of reaching. I don't have to manipulate anything because what I'm saying, it's just literally what it is. Right. And once the, once the mind is then open and can see the connection between language and context, and then it can challenge the previous belief by what it's now hearing, then that just opens the, the floodgates are open. And, and it becomes very simple to, to listen to and to dissect. Difficult, to, it's challenging to accept, to accept, easy to hear and to right. think about. Right, uh, well, I'm not so sure. I, I, I mean, I, I think I get it and I'm not, a, I'm not necessarily like the smartest guy in the world, but I'm not the dumbest guy in the world. I think I get it. Uh, and, uh, but uh, I would still, you know, there's a lot there for me to unpack. It was, you know, so far, you know, 25 minutes into this conversation, I am severe, severely mind blown, like in a way that I haven't been from talking to anybody else about this kind of stuff. So I'm going to have to think about what you said. I'm, I'm going to have to play it back, honestly, and listen to it again and say, you know, what do I really, really think about this? Because my initial reaction was just, wow. Like, you know, like almost like stunning. Uh, and I, I'm I'm just imagining that the kind because this is where I'm going with this. The preachers that I've listened to, uh, they would turn on you like and, and what really turns me against organized religion in a strong way is uh, I've seen preachers and and people out there. And it always comes down to if I don't do things according to the way they think things should be done. If I don't truly believe in the way they th say life should be lived and, and, and live my life accordingly, then I'm going to hell. And they come right out and they say that I'm going to hell. And I always come back to your own religion teaches you that you can't condemn me to hell. So, <laughs> uh, and that really bothers me. And like, who are you to tell me, you know, you're not, if you, you're you no claiming God's right for yourself then and putting yourself above me and saying, I'm going to hell, you're condemning me, that's a turnoff. And I, for religion, I think that's a bad marketing ploy to begin with. But uh, so that's my major turnoff. You had any uh, input on that or in, of, insight? Of course. It's, it's, it's such a turnoff that the illustration of the man crucified depicts that your turnoff is correct <laughs> because the bible itself teaches that this aspect of religion is 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 brutally false yeah and, and that that's that's what the main illustration of the man crucified means that crucified body means that the way that traditional religion goes about their business it's not how the true living god would go about a human being honoring what they believe his words thoughts and feelings to be are it's mm. it's completely false so that that's that's true and in paul in his letters dealt with exactly what you said i would deal with he, he he dealt with it the real man himself was crucified because of the things i'm saying and what i write about and so like i it's kind of like i expect it but at the same time it's just sort of like this needs to get said because we're we're losing our mind, and especially this 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 society that we're now living in. Uh, we're, there's a lot of people thinking this pandemic is some sort of special sign of some sort, and the 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 plague that religion may be leading decent minds into, instead of understanding the the context and the language for that, is devastating. Because what I'm saying is that the definition of the term quote unquote salvation that we're taught is false according to the bible and that's where the main, that's where the main issue is because oh uh, go ahead because if if like as you were saying if it's challenging i see that it's challenging also and it's challenging from the as from the aspect of one economics economically and two uh, spiritually because if this one individual figure if if true that I can actually, and I can, 
prove that there was no historical record of this person, but there was a historical record of a rabbi that did preach a very revolutionary doctrine, then the entire point of salvation within the Christian religion and in religion in general, it kind of collapses, but then it leads into a new definition of salvation, which is the salvation that the Bible teaches. Uh, liberation of mind, liberation of the conversation's conscience is the true definition of, of salvation. Wow. At this point, at this point in time, while our heart is beating. Uh, again, that that's a super heavy thought, bro. Um, <laughs> so, but is there is there benefit or power? Because I I've always thought there was benefit and power in imagining this real person as Jesus Christ going through that enormous sacrifice of a bead of, you know, a crown of thorns and, and being nailed to a cross and, and all of that go and tortured and carrying his own cross. Is there power and benefit to that? Or is that a, not a good, good mind um, exercise, I guess. I mean, I don't, I don't doubt that the real man himself dealt with that because at that time, a society in and of itself and the way that they, they handled religion, religion was the state back then. So if you had to say something against the state, you're, say, you're saying something against a religion and the God of religion and the state and God were the same. So I have no issue believing that the man himself went through all of that that he went through. The, the thing is, is it, it changes when the context of the man changes, when you're not seeing the man as religion is, is depicting him to be. As a flesh, a flesh representation of, of divinity. Yeah, that which is false. Right. And it, and it changes what the definition of divine actually is. And it changes the definition of what holy is. It changes the definition of, of what that actual, what was sacrificed is what the, is what the question is and what it becomes. And, and that's where the, the divide between religion and personal devotional philosophy comes because what was sacrificed was not a man for human beings to go to somewhere after they die. That's either positive or negative. The, the sacrifice representing a religious philosophy, one religious philosophy was sacrificed illustratively for another or figuratively for another. That's all the sacrifice was. It was a sacrifice of philosophy on how to better the mind both as a human being and devotionally. Wow. Yep. So so the, the question now, and, and maybe this has nothing, you don't really care about this, but I, I am curious about this. If I, re, if I share this, my, my, my wife has a, um, uh, a religious group on, on social media where they are just very based in, in religious discussion. And 90, I would say 90% of those are Christian. There are uh, some Muslims and some Jews in there, but they go back and forth. If I share this in that group, you're going to get attacked. I'm going to get attacked too. I'm used to getting attacked, but you are going to get attacked brutally by that. Are you not concerned by uh, the re uh, negative reactions that you're going to cause in, in rocking a 2000 year old boat? <laughs> Well, I mean, it, that just goes back to the original question that you asked is, is there a true benefit to that, to going to seeing all of that? And the answer is, yeah, the answer is, I don't care if the man, if that man himself didn't care. And, he, you know, he, he, he did that for the philosophy of liberation for not just himself, but generations afterward. For me, uh, th there will always be hate because religion is is religion is like venom you know religion gets into the dna and it latches on and it makes you think that you're it and once you think that you're it it becomes as real as it will ever be and that yeah. it makes it difficult to separate you know what i think i think it's fear of uh losing my identity if i believed in this thing completely my whole life long and you come along and shake my belief in that in any way now i have to question who i am and what i am and what it means to be me and that's a scary thing for a lot of people that so i think a lot of times what what manifests in in what we call hate is really just a lot of fear and somebody told me that too just as you were talking it reminded me of somebody that said i've been living this way for 65 years what what am I supposed to do now? 
Right, right. <laughs> That's the fear. It's like I got to look myself in the mirror, and and uh, I'm going to not know that person. Uh, who is he? Who, what What do you believe? Wh- where are you? What does it mean to be you? What does it mean to be human in this world, and and, and spirit, and and all that stuff in this world today? And so what? That's why I was I'm blown away by what you're saying today because. It does resonate with me. It changes uh, my perspective on a lot of things, although I I see and I tend to agree with you on almost everything you said because it rings so true with me. But on some level, it does challenge uh, a lot of the beliefs I've had about this stuff. And then I, if I challenge my beliefs, I have to challenge my my belief about myself as well. And that that's a scary place to be for a lot of people. <laughs> it's scary, but to me... I- I, I would love I would love to be like 75 and to and for me to be saying that to me at 75 because even then it's I'm yeah. I'm alive my my heart is beating for a purpose I'm, I'm you know my heart is beating so that I don't live in a deception I'm my heart is beating so I can decode my level of consciousness to sort of let it be at its highest potential that it can be in a very loving way both to myself and to the people around me. And, you know, if I'm not at that level of consciousness, I would want to be at that level of, con- I personally would accept that challenge of, of that transition because that's, to me, that's the definition of life. That's right. the definition of being human. You know, you talk about the, as, as awkward as the religion of evolution is, adaptability is, is it's, you know, one of its prime concepts. Right. And, and what's scary is new religions that are being created uh, in the in the new world is can be even far more dangerous than any of the old world religions. I mean, they because they they are fed by people who explicitly get into it for political or or financial gain and, and think, how am I going to run this scam? In, in a lot of ways, uh, and so that's and I'm not doubting that originally in somewhere in in the history of the Roman Catholic Church that was actually communicated in direct language, like how, how we're going to how we're going to get the people to follow us and send us money and, and give us political power. Uh, evil exists. Does, so do you think evil exists or, or not? In a sense of demons? In, in, in no, all- in, in a sense that man has the capacity to say, I'm going to construct a religion, get all these people to follow me, give me money, give me power, and 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 just kind of deceive them in a way just as long as i keep getting what i want out of it uh, to me well, that that's an evil thing right well of, of course going back to the the first book of genesis after that pair was created in the image of god they were then giving given a commandment and their commandment was to reproduce multiply and the key commandment being to subdue the earth and that's kind of what the concept of religion is about. That's what the image of God is in the first book of Genesis. The image of God is a concept called religion and religion in a sense is given a commandment to subdue the earth by force. And that's really what evil is. Right. That's that's the only, there are positive benefits to it. You know, it can it can make you think better. It can make you think healthier, but at the end of the day, religion is um, something that's used for conquering and for conquering in a secular and also non-secular sense. And li- liberation from that is what the Bible teaches in the second book of Genesis with the creation of that individual called Adam. Well, uh, as you say that, I'm, I'm wondering: Have you taken the time? Because you say you go, you're going back and and correcting errors you find in the King James Bible. Are you taking the time to document all this in in, uh, in specifically long form, like just make corrections throughout wholesale corrections throughout the Bible and publish it? I I haven't thought I've done that with certain books. Like for example, I've I've rewritten the Book of Ephesians. Uh, so I've I've taken the the Greek, uh, the English, retranslated it off into the Greek, even looked at a little bit of Hebrew words just to get a better sense of it. But and then I retranslated it back to the English. All of the entire book of Ephesians, 
I've done that for Colossians, uh, the Corinthians, but you I haven't done that. Yeah, it's a huge job. I know. It's, it, it, it'll, it'll probably take your whole life to do the entire thing to go back and kind of cross reference and find out exactly what it says. I know that, but, but when I what, do it, when I do it, it's it's strictly for the research subject that I'm doing it in, so I don't actually document it. Document it. Right. It's just sort of this is just research for this chapter, and I need to go back and understand it. So I don't document it, but it's in the chapter. Okay. Uh, so uh, first off, I have an apology for you be, uh, uh, because when we promoted this program, I did not. I I I had the wrong latest book up. I think I had the Bible Sabbath. Uh, your latest book is called Growth. Now, the question I have for you, the books, you have six books out. Uh, are they meant, c- can somebody read Growth having not read the other six and really understand it? Or do, are they meant to kind of start at the beginning, which was, I don't know, what, what's the name of your first book? Um, Perfecting and Reforming Personal Religion. That was the very first one. Yeah. So so uh, the question is, can it do, are they meant to start back there, the first one, or can they start? Pick up growth, which is your latest book, and make sense of that. They're they're a trilogy of sort, where each book kind of explains the this the the, the councils that were in the last book. In in that sense, yes. But also, you can pick up any individual of those books and just just go at it. But growth growth is um is a different kind of book because it's a poetry book. So it's it's just it's a complete book of poetry illustrating the the experience from from my other books. Gotcha. Uh, so the a URL for Linwood's website is in the scroll. It will be in the description as well. It already is in the description. It's linwoodjacksonjr.com. Pretty simple. Uh, uh, Linwood is L I N W O O D jacksonjr.com. And uh, Junior is abbreviated J R. There you go. Uh, and the link to where you can buy his books on Amazon is also in the description. So uh, you can check them out now. The latest book is, is called Growth. Um, you wanted to talk about the book or uh, give people an idea of what, what they're going to get from the book? Yeah, you buy Growth and you, you open up that book. You're going to actually be reading um, my, my own personal experience with the philosophy within the Bible. You know, the characters. You, male and female characters there they're not necessarily real male and females the, the male is my heart but the female is my mind so you're you're reading that sort of you know dialogue uh, creative and critical to my experience of how it is when somebody is is just learning how to love their self and how to marry their self with their thoughts and feelings and doing so through the counsel that are in the bible not explicitly stating that the count that the process is through the philosophy in the Bible, but the experience is related to, to the councils, right. to their implementation. So I'm curious now, because in when I uh, introduced you and I talked about through not just your books, but the speeches. Now, uh, how, how are you getting this, uh, your ideas and philosophy out there. Um, mm-hmm. when I had a guest on a couple, not a couple of weeks ago, about 10 days ago now. And his goal was to, uh, possibly affect 2 million lives each day. And I thought, wow, what a wow. lofty goal. I'm trying to, I'm lucky if I reach 200,000 people in a month, but I can't imagine how you reach 2 million people in, in a single day, every single day. It's a, an extremely lofty goal. Uh, wh- how are you getting your message out there uh, and kind of speeches we're talking about, where do they take place and what's going on? Online. It's, it's tough to find, you know, not necessarily, I'll say it's tough to find a, a physical location but it's also tough to find open-mindedness. <laughs> so especially when it comes to what I'm talking about, I'm, I'm giving philosophy and I'm also giving religion and I'm, I'm broadening the two. And so there's definite conflict when I, for example, go somewhere and then they, they, say, they say something like, oh, you're not Christian enough. We can't have you here. Oh. And, you know, I can't get mad at that because in a sense, the religion that they are, it's not necessarily the religion that I'm giving that's in the Bible or the philosophy in the Bible. So it's just like, that's a complicated, that's a complicated acceptance that I need to accept right there. 
It, it's and, not even in line with with how they preach the religion because Jesus would say certainly let him in. The the Jesus that they talk about would certainly say yes, let him in. He's exactly the kind of person who needs to hear my message, right? <laughs> that's. But then there's there's the other side where it's it's not religion and it's strictly secular and it's sort of like well. We'll have you here, but you just can't link this to that. We'll have you here, but you just can't, you know, define that in that way. And so, you know, the the reaching that I'm I'm reaching, it's it's more based on the books that I publish, also the the different audio pieces that I, I put out there, and also the different shows that that I'm on, and I get phone calls from different people and different people emailing me about whether it's questions or changes they're now going through or we've just left our church and we saw you here and we want to hear more you know it's it's things like that uh this is kind of i'm sure natural curiosity for, for people as they're listening to this uh what what happened in your life that led you to this <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, that's a pretty blunt, quick, blunt way to do it. But uh, tell me about your experience that led you to the philosophy you now uh, hold. Yeah, I the experience was me going through college. Um, I went through college and I graduated. And when I did graduate, I didn't, I didn't retain anything that I went through. I did it just because society says you have to do it, and you're told that this is what you have to do in your life to be something. You know, but then, you know, you go through it and you realize you didn't do it for you. And then you realize that you go through it and also, oh, society also looks at me at a certain way because I look a certain way and my degrees really mean nothing. And, you know, the anger built up from that, from listening to the opinions and not really thinking about what I wanted to do with my own life. And from that, I ended up wanting to claim something of my own that I could say, this is me. And I picked up bodybuilding. Um, it was just for fun, but I enjoyed the pain. I used the pain as a way to say, this is the correction that you need from the universe. Feel this pain and love this pain because you deserve it. And that kind of built up. And I overdid it with the supplements I was taking. Um, that ended me up into the hospital to where I you know, was damaged. Uh, damaged a nerve in my body and had to restart the whole process of eating, digestion, heart beating, breathing. And it was sort of like, why would I abuse myself while not looking at myself and saying, what do you need to do with yourself? Why would I rather turn to self-abuse when I didn't even do anything to myself mentally? It was, I'm, I'm allowing elements to do something to myself mentally so why would i take out that on myself and not think to myself you need to think a little bit higher why would i choose abuse over that that led me to look at different philosophies out there that led me to look at different teachings on on self and on whatever because i knew that i was lacking love i didn't have knowledge of love within myself why didn't i have it how come it wasn't great in me why isn't this genetically built into me no yeah. philosophy no philosophy really cut it for me and i didn't want to turn to religion because it just i just didn't need it i didn't need something to take me out of looking at myself right i get so, that so I then get that. <laughs> so then i immediately you know wasn't really raised in like a religious house but it was sort of like there's an eye watching you so i really need to talk to this eye and i really need to see where this is this eye isn't in philosophy this I isn't in any sort of constructed way of thinking that's community-based knowledge. And so I picked up the Bible to see what was in it. And the councils that were in it were, were living councils for me physically, which helped my body, but also mentally. And the diet that I retained from it was a diet of love. And I got the true definition of love. And to this day, I'm still, the entire reason why I study the Bible is for its definition of love. You know, it just so happens that along the way, that definition is kind of darkened by another aspect of religion and, and what the Christian religion is. So to get to that definition of love, I have to explain what that definition is not, which is in the Christian religion. Then I can line those pieces up and then I can show what the definition of love is from the creator. 
that is out there for us. And that that's and that's how I got here. I got wow. here strictly for the definition of love. Hmm. So, and what is the definition of love? <laughs> definition of love, um, according to the Bible and according to the Hebrew, um, is is edification. The definition of love is edification. So when when you're loving yourself, you're edifying your personal and devotional self on how to think beyond your human condition and the impulses of your human condition. You know, when you don't love yourself, you're not edifying yourself to understand that you don't need to watch this or do this or have this or eat this or wear this to feel like you are a human being existing. Wow. Wow. Good stuff. Good stuff. You know, uh, I think that's something most of us struggle with. I know I do often. Uh, and uh, the other day I posted on social media a question. I said, I, this is a, an unusual day for me. I, I hate myself. Does, and, and I don't often go through those days, but does anybody else have that? Does anybody else ever experience mm -hmm. that? And I've got a ton of comments. Most of them said, yeah, I'll go through that. But I, several people said, no, never, not me, not ever. And those people who said that, I know they have the same uh, same issues with human condition that I have and the same failures and the same frustrations. But they said, no, never. And I, it made me question, what what is the difference that some people can have that never, never, not loving themselves uh, and to the, almost the opposite where well, I hate myself today. It's just one of those days where I hate myself and can't figure it out and can't get out of that funk. Eventually I did get out of that funk, but uh, the, the problem, the issue, the separation thing that separates people who don't have that from people who do have that. Uh, what do you think that is? <laughs> experience, Ex experience with your experience with yourself. I, I think, the only reason that somebody could ever say I hate myself is because that they understand that there's a reason for them to love themselves. And they haven't found that reason yet. And they haven't found that definition yet. They've gone through experiences that have not really led them to the self-actualization that those experiences are to lead them to. Whoever says no, they haven't gone through enough self-actualization experiences to realize that they are imperfect. That's, yeah. what, I, that, that's what I think. It's, it's, it's the a reason. There's a reason for why I hate myself. We hate ourselves. And that reason is because I haven't found what clicks about who I am to rationalize it. You know, sometimes I think I get caught up too much in the illusion that other people put out there and judging myself against them. And when I see and when I do that, you know, jealousy, envy, whatever comes through, because somebody might be portraying themselves as perfect or uh, putting up this this facade and I buy into it and then judge myself against that. And I, I'm not that. And then I get down on myself and beat myself up over it. And sometimes it's important to remember that nobody's perfect so the people who are acting like they are uh are, should be suspect and i shouldn't even care what how they're acting but we, it's so prevalent now that people social media plays a big yeah. part in that and people just putting on this facade of a, a fake uh life that they they think they have or want to have and we buy into it but i for me i think it comes down to forgetting that i should be judging myself against me and my expectations of myself and look at other people and externally and get full of envy and jealousy a lot of times and that that's my own fault but then again i'll come back to that and say why, why do i buy into that envy and jealousy that's another reason for me not to like myself <laughs> it's just being human you know it it, it, ne it never stops and uh, for me, for me personally, I I really don't care about saying that whether I love myself or I don't hate myself, or I hate myself, I don't love myself. You know, for me, it's I I understand that love isn't genetically built into me or to anyone else. So I know you're lying when you say you have no problems, because I have problems um, internally and mentally that have not been, you know taught to me to ha to be handled as a child, as a teenager. No, nobody sat me down. So it's just like 21 years later, you get a self rev a re a revolution of, of thought. And, you know, nine years later, you now have a philosophy of being that you're trying to cultivate to make up for the 21 years of loss. <laughs> and 
in you know in in some different cases it's not 21 years it's 31 years 41 years 51 years or whatever it may be but that 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 making up of the loss is what makes being human and being alive worth it very cool stuff <laughs> yeah um so the question i have now is has this shift in philosophy this this change that took obviously was an evolution to uh, for you to get where you are today has it cost you personal relationships in in your life yeah yeah i would it it, it, it costs you personal relationships because you know whether it's uh, with a female one it's hard to find a female that that is into mental health and, and growth and development and will not look at the life of somebody else to feel jealous about their life. And whether it's male to have a male friend, it, it's difficult to be so strong in your mind that, you know, the conflicting beliefs are just not enough to handle. Right. And, I would think um, you, you scare people away with, with telling this, this truth that you found. Uh, again, you know, um, my reaction was, whoa, and I, I'd never met you before. So I can imagine that people who, who have been in your life and hear you, uh, you know, and watch this kind of change happening to you all of a sudden to, who is Linwood? I don't even recognize him anymore. And then the more you start talking about this thing, they have to say, who am I? I don't even recognize <laughs> him anymore. And, and so that's, again, we come back to fear. Uh, so I, uh, that's why I asked the question. I could see that happening where people just say, you know, he's getting too heavy for me. I, I, I got to step back because uh, if I, if I follow him or if I listen to him anymore, I might go down that rabbit hole and might have to look at myself and my own life and what I truly believe. And there we are back in fear again. Fear is the biggest halter on this whole thing. Uh, yeah, I'm learning that fear. I've heard fear is stronger than love, but I'm now seeing that it's a it's a real thing. It's especially especially when you you know you get to somebody and you what you're saying clicks with an issue, and it's sort of like I can either realize that what they're saying is dealing with my issue, or I can say that the issue that I have isn't a real issue because of what they're saying, and then that's the clash. And then right. that's the separation from what who I am and from what they believe. It's sort of like, man, I don't want to realize that what he's saying is actually something to think about. Right. So, so if people uh, want to know more about this, do you are you uh, do you have anything coming up or any kind of online, uh, you know, type of event or any way where you're going to be talking about this where people can learn more about it? Yeah, I do. I I don't have a date uh, set just yet. It's it's um in preparation, but I do, but I just don't have a date set yet. Well, when you do have it, you can send it to me. I will put it in the description and people will be able to, to at least find it there. We can help promote that. I think, you know, it would be good for more people to keep an open mind and listen to what you, what you have to say. Again, uh, anybody who's listened to this conversation, it's very deep for me. And I've been involved in these kind of conversations for 40 years now. Very deep conversation. And it's deep for me. So I can imagine anybody who's not used to deep conversations, this is going to be very deep. What I suggest is you re download it and rewind it from the beginning. Listen to it slowly. One question and answer at a time and kind of sit back and think about this stuff because it is heavily and it's life changing life altering type of ideas that that come out of this uh so you know i thank you for for this and i, I would do hope we can help get more exposure to what you're talking about i do think it's something people think that need to think about and consider at least at the very at the very least consider what you're saying and and let them decide uh where the truth is for them i appreciate it too because it's you know we're talking about religion, but there's also I come into the atheistic community, right? And and you know it's they're they're also a people that they're questioning the aspect of religion without actually looking at what is within the document that they're questioning. So when I do show an atheist, listen, you're not wrong. What you're saying is true. Everything you're saying is right. But here's where you're not extending yourself, and then that's when they get frustrated. <laughs> so, it's, so it's sort of like you know you're not you're not wrong but this is sort of you're going in the right direction but you have to factor in uh, this principle and this point you have to stop looking at this literally and look at it analogically 
And then it's sort of like, you know, there's enough brain power there to realize that what they're reading isn't true, but there's not enough brain power to realize that there's truth in the untruth that they're reading. Right. Yeah, so, I, it's a whole different concept of, of how to look at the truth that, and, and how to absorb it and, and, and think about what truth, what the truth really is and that truth that you're understanding. I get that, and it, but uh, I think, and when you mention atheists, I think they're just like the rest of us. If, yeah. You know, if, if they're just struggling to trying to find that truth. Yeah. And if you, if you ask them to challenge their beliefs at all, you know, I'm going to close up. That's just a yep. natural human reaction. I don't want to challenge my own beliefs because, you know, if I do, then I have to have to look at my whole life in a whole different way. Who wants to do that? I'm a, I just want to go to work and, and come home and watch television. <laughs> it's true. They're, yeah. they're, they're, they're going through the same same sort of they're 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 frustrated. They, they have their frustration is the frustration that a typical religious person should have. Wow. So, and and their frustration is, I'm too rational for this irrationality. But but their their mistake is is that, first of all, what they're reading it's not a Western book. The book is Eastern. The philosophy within the Bible is written from Eastern minds. To read the Bible from a Western perspective, is is just so wrong. Right. It's it's to see. DNA, for example, as the complete structure of a human being and believing that that's just the the entire thing of what a human being is, but you're just you're not really understanding that DNA is just a blueprint. You know, there's there's blueprints of houses, and I can stand on a blueprint of a house, but that doesn't mean I'm in a house. <laughs> the <laughs> DNA DNA is simply blueprint, but what makes DNA the encoded structure, the encoded unchanging structure that it is, is epigenetics. Right. And that's what's missing from the atheistic perspective. The atheist is seeing DNA. They're seeing that DNA is not all that there is to building the structure that is in the Bible. But they're not extending their mind enough to see what the encoded field or stream of thought is. And that's what I, that's what I write about. I write about the epigenetics of what the Bible's philosophy is. Wow. Instead of just giving the blueprint. Good stuff, my friend. Good stuff. I am. I am definitely impressed. I'm going to be. Uh, I can tell you. I'm going to be looking deeper into this, uh, and I encourage my my listeners to as well. It's the URL is LinwoodJacksonJr. dot com, and the URL to where you can buy the books on Amazon will be in the description as well. I hope people will support you. I thank you for coming. And listen, the, the door is open here. If you want to come back when you do have a date and just kind of promote it, or just send me it, and I'll put it in the link in the description. Here here uh I definitely and you know i think there's more to be learned from you i i appreciate your time and i wish you great success and thank you for coming today thank you thank you for having me thanks bye for now this episode is brought to you by put me in the story put me in the story creates personalized books for kids by taking best-selling children's picture books and well-loved characters and allowing you to create personalized books that make your child the star of the story alongside their favorite characters. Save 25% store-wide when you click the link on MindDogTV.com and use the code SAVE25. We're also sponsored by Lovely. Lovely is your online stop for modern, irresistible, and affordable women's clothing. Never before has dressing yourself been so easy. Lovely's carefully curated selection of apparel, accessories, and outerwear are always on trend and always available at the web's best prices. Lovely is dedicated to delivering high-quality clothing to women that will make them look and feel their best. They believe every woman has the right to dress well and shouldn't have to spend a lot to love how she looks. They make it easy to wear outfits you love every day, giving you the confidence to take on the world. Lovely.com summer fashion trends are now 40% off, starting at just $5.99. Get an extra 18% off when you click the link on MindDogTV.com and use the code JFT18. We're also sponsored by Vapor DNA. Founded in 2013, 
Vapor DNA is the premier online vape store offering an industry leading selection of electronic cigarettes, e liquids, and accessories. Their friendly and knowledgeable customer service team is always ready to provide the best customer service experience to ensure you find what you're looking for. They guarantee their products to be 100% genuine and at the lowest possible price. They're so confident in their selection and customer service, they offer their customers a 45 day refund policy. Save 20% when you click the link on minddogtv.com and use the code ORIONQ. Linwood Jackson Jr., folks, uh, I don't even know where to begin with that. It was just very mind blowing, very, very, I wasn't prepared for, for, for that that level of holy crap <laughs> you rocked my world with with some heavy philosophy there uh so and uh, i would suggest to you to do what i'm going to do and i've already mentioned it download it take it one bit at a time and and listen carefully and think about it uh open your mind uh, and and consider this on a very deep level and try to uh really if if it comes to you a little bit slowly, don't be ashamed of that. Some of this stuff is really heavy thought. It's not just like uh, religion talk that you, you hear so often. It's very, very deep. So I hope you got something out of it. I hope you come back and tell your friends about it and subscribe. Go to my YouTube channel. Go to minddogtv.com and get on my mailing list uh, so you know when we're going to have a great guest on and Maybe you'll know when Linwood comes back, if he does come back. And uh, questions and comments for me, info at minddogtv.com. I especially want to hear comments at info at minddogtv.com about what you think about all this stuff today, what you took away from it, what you you learned today. If you learned anything, did it change the way you think about anything? Please write to me, info at minddogtv.com. Till tonight when my guest is... Tiffany Yelverton, who is an, another author, uh, and her books are all about sex. So we'll, that we're going to talk about sex. What else? Uh, so uh, please join me then, 8 p.m. Eastern. Until then, I'm Matt Napple from the Mind Dog TV podcast. Thanks for coming. Have a great day, and bye for now. Hi.